In 1777, a band of British redcoats and loyalist volunteers wreaked havoc upon the towns and farmland of colonial Connecticut. Their mission? To set fire to countless homes and stores of goods in an effort to weaken the American resistance. By 1792, after years of appeal to the state, these farmers and their children were given reparations in the form of land in the distant Connecticut Western Reserve. These families, known as the Fire Sufferers, made the long journey to this remote area, which today makes up a sizable portion of Northwest Ohio, and has come to be known simply as the Firelands. Oddly, the area they settled had, at one time, been burned by the native Indians on an annual basis to rejuvenate the prairie in which they lived. For more than 100 years, the settlers of the area would reap the benefits of this fertile soil. But as the U.S. involvement in World War II appeared imminent, the government would turn to this American heartland for a matter of national defense. Thousands of acres, countless men, and millions of gallons of water were going to be needed. And within one year, the families thriving on the land would be gone, setting into motion a cycle of beginnings and endings that would come to define the land where they once lived. the United States government began making preparations to enter World War II. As part of this effort, they were to purchase over 44 million acres across Inner America for the creation of ordnance facilities. The U.S. Department of Defense realized that they could not produce enough trinitrotoluene, TNT, high explosive, to wage the kind of war that was on the horizon. Once operable, these facilities would provide desperately needed munitions to the boys overseas. By January of 1941, 9,000 contiguous acres of private farmland of the Firelands were earmarked to become one such site, the Plum Brook Ordnance Works. Dig your hand in the land, touch the toil and sorrow in the soil, where the greenbacks never grow on what I borrowed. Dig down and tell me where's my seed for tomorrow. Representatives from the War Department descended on the area and began a round of stiff negotiations with over 150 local families over. for their property. Nope, I'm not selling now. Uh, that's not common sense. I remember uh, how the people came. They treated uh, uh, the uh, landowners very rudely, and most landowners were not as upset about the fact that some land is the fact how they were treated. Despite appeals from the community, the government agents left the farmers with few options. It was my father that uh, he protested the amount of money he got. He didn't get very much for the piece of property. And the government guy took the money, threw it on the floor, and said, that's what you're going to get. The residents were ordered to vacate the land by April 15, 1941. Houses were raised, livestock was slaughtered, and 500 bodies from the local cemetery were exhumed and buried elsewhere. 
It's a remarkable thing. In April or May, you can drive down the back roads, and where the old farmhouses were, the only thing left 60 years later are the daffodils. And you see the little beds of daffodils, and there was a family once who gave up their life at Nassau Plumbrook for the Allied war effort. Within months, lush fields were replaced with three TNT plants, one pentalite plant, 99 storage bunkers for the explosives, and a host of support facilities. Over 700 buildings in all. Yet despite its massive size, the Plum Brook Ordnance Works became a close-knit community, holding dances, movie nights, and even bond drive events, such as this one with Abbott and Costello. Good old-fashioned pride and patriotism united the workers and spurred them on to break several production records. During its four-year life, the works would go on to produce a staggering near one billion pounds of powder. And yet, the chemical reaction of TNT was no match for a new type of reaction being studied under the top secret Manhattan Project. For centuries, philosophers had debated the fundamental building blocks of all matter, from the basic elements the very substance of human beings. Recent scientific developments had defined those building blocks as atoms and given rise to a method of splitting them apart. This nuclear fission released tremendous amounts of energy that could be harnessed for use as power or unleashed for other purposes. On July 16, 1945, the world's first nuclear test explosion was executed at Alamo Gordo, New Mexico. Less than a month later, atomic bombs were dropped on Hiroshima and Nagasaki. The horrors of the atomic age had become real. Uncontrolled nuclear reactions are mean. You have to control them. That's all there is to it. Japan surrendered. World War II had come to an end. An end to the war brought about an immediate closure of the Plum Brook Ordnance Works. Word simply came down, Trojan powder works, you're done. Everyone just put their pencil down, grabbed uh, their hat, and left and closed the doors. Just as the farmers had once been forced to leave the very same land, so too had the employees of the ordnance works. They could have had no idea that this pattern would one day repeat itself yet again. Nor could they have known that the controlled nuclear fission process would breathe new life into the fields of Plum Brook. The workers gone, the once bustling city became a ghost town. As the men and women of the Ordnance Works found new lives elsewhere, the grounds remained fenced and protected, giving rise to a unique natural preserve. The peace brought on by the end of the war was short-lived for the Soviet Union had developed its own atomic weapons. The rival superpowers faced off in a Cold War. Let us face, without panic, the reality of our times, the fact that atom bombs may someday be dropped on our cities. And let us prepare for survival by understanding the weapon that threatens us. If you are at home when a surprise attack occurs, call beneath the table if it is very near, or drop to the floor with your back to the window. The immediate danger is over in about a minute. In an effort to introduce some positive benefits from this frightening nuclear age, President Eisenhower presented his Atoms for Peace invocation before the United Nations in 1953. In addition to atomic-powered automobiles, trains, and aircraft, 
Nuclear energy promised to benefit medicine, agriculture, and manufacturing. The Philip Morris Company even hailed an atomic mechanism that weighed and measured cigarettes as they came off the production line. The possibilities for the new age seemed endless. Of course, the military remained a primary player in the nuclear field. In 1954, the Navy launched the world's first nuclear-powered submarine, the Nautilus. The Nautilus, first atomic submarine, launches a new era in naval history. Mrs. Dwight Eisenhower arrives for the ceremonies. The First Lady, momentarily distracted, must swing quickly to christen the undersea's giant. Majestically, the fabulous submarine slides down the waves. Built at a cost of $50 million, she will be able to circle the globe in 29 days without resurfacing on a few nuggets of uranium. The age of atomic navies is born. At the same time, the U.S. Air Force and the Atomic Energy Commission, or AEC, had begun development of a nuclear-powered aircraft. The project was named the Aircraft Nuclear Propulsion Program, or ANP for short. Spurred in large part by rumors of a Russian nuclear aircraft, the ANP program promised a plane that would one day stay aloft for weeks at a time and still have the power to make a brisk bombing run over Russia. This B-36 bomber carried a reactor for non-propulsive tests over Texas and New Mexico from 1955 to 1957. However, a nuclear-powered airplane had yet to fly. Before a plane could be powered by a nuclear reactor, there were many technological roadblocks to be overcome, including the weight of the massive shielding needed to protect the in-flight crew and contain the reactor, should there be a crash. In addition, engine components suffered breakdown in the nuclear environment. The AEC efforts were aided by studies being performed at an NACA facility in Cleveland, Ohio. The National Advisory Committee for Aeronautics established the Cleveland Center in 1941. Originally named the Aircraft Engine Research Lab, it eventually would come to be known as the NACA Lewis Research Center, after Dr. George Lewis, NACA Director of Aeronautical Research. As early as 1951, the engineers at Lewis were studying the feasibilities of nuclear propulsion. These efforts were spearheaded by Lewis Associate Director Dr. Abe Silverstein. Those who knew him would credit him with being a true leader. I have to say, I think he was an outstanding leader, uh, very sensitive to significant technical issues. He had just an automatic feel for technology. Brilliant and visionary, Silverstein would go on to one day assist in the formation of NASA, lead the build-up to Project Mercury, and help establish the Apollo program. Um, uh at the foot of the ladder. A program which he was credited with having named. Prior to these events, Silverstein embarked on a massive reorganization of the Lewis team in 1956, disbanding an entire division to focus their attention on nuclear research. He then selected the brightest engineers and scientists to attend a nuclear school taught by a handful of Lewis researchers who had been performing nuclear studies since the late 1940s. What he did was he went to, primarily, as I recall, it was a compressor and turbine division, and he selected some of the best people over there. And that's exactly what happened. I got into that school with about 20 other people and worked as a student. Basically, it was like learning from scratch. Yes, oh yes, top secret. In 1955, an NACA nuclear test reactor was proposed to the AEC, while actual development of the nuclear aircraft would be performed elsewhere. This facility would support the ANP program through study of radiation's effects on nuclear aircraft materials. Uh, the nuclear environment, of course, can cause a variety of changes to these materials and devices, and it was very important to know how they would perform when they were actually integrated into the, the nuclear hardware. Abe Silverstein wanted to make sure that Lewis would secure a significant position in the AMP nuclear research. By landing the test reactor facility, he could secure that position well into the future. We were the aircraft engine people at Lewis. There was no question about that. And therefore, we felt we ought to be able to get involved with any application of nuclear energy related to aircraft propulsion. 
The competition for the facility was stiff. NACA examined 19 possible sites for the reactor across Ohio and Pennsylvania. Because of the existence of much of the required infrastructure and its proximity to both Lake Erie and the Lewis Lab, the Plum Brook Ordnance Works was chosen. Lewis sent a crew of men up to the old Ordnance Works to ascertain its condition. There were a group of us who came up here to go over the various facilities that were here to see what might be used and could be used in equipment and facilities of the old TNT plant. They would find a sleeping city of 700 buildings, untouched since the end of World War II. They opened up these wooden, uh, all wooden buildings, and it was time frozen in the summer of 1945. The calendars all said June, July, or August, or whatever it was. Coffee cups were there, the coffee had evaporated. Uh, it was frozen history, frozen time. NACA decided to retain 41 of the 700 buildings, all of the 99 TNT bunkers, and the two water pumping stations in Lake Erie. The rest of the buildings would have to go because of dangerous contamination. Uh, when NASA took this over in the 1950s, uh, common to the time, those had to disappear, and those were set on fires in conflagrations uh, the early NASA people say were spectacular beyond belief because there was TNT laying all over. TNT, when it burns, does not explode, but it flames up in great big orange flames. And basically how they got rid of the buildings, they put straw and oil in them, uh, heavy oil, and burn them to the ground because it was too dangerous to try to go in and tear them down. It was quite, uh, quite a sight an end of an extremely important uh, period of history. And so the flames that were so much a part of the area's history returned once more. The ordnance structures were burned to the ground, taking with them the last vestige of a proud group of men and women who had worked round the clock to support the needs of their country. Soon, the embers would cool, and the ground would be turned over once more for the benefit of the nation. Meanwhile, in Cleveland, a group of men who had never designed a nuclear research reactor were busy doing just that. But would their innovative design measure up to its $10 million price tag? Would the atomic plane it was designed to support ever fly? And perhaps most importantly, would their reactor make a significant and lasting contribution to the field of nuclear propulsion? NACA leaders and local officials spoke at the groundbreaking ceremony of 1956. Abe Silverstein said, Nuclear power is the shining hope for increasing the range of aircraft at high speeds. He continued, A long-range bomber may carry 100,000 pounds or more of fuel. A piece of uranium-235 with the same amount of energy would weigh less than an ounce. At Lewis, Sam Kaufman and Ted Hallman were busy working on the design of the facility. Hallman had a doctorate in nuclear engineering, but Kaufman and many of the others involved in the design had little formal nuclear training. In order to grasp the nuclear physics needed for the project, the engineers studied textbooks and visited other nuclear facilities at Oak Ridge in Tennessee and Argonne West in Idaho. They would go on to design a facility that included a 60 megawatt test reactor, a 100 kilowatt research reactor, a seven cell hot lab complex, and an office building with chemistry labs. The facility would rest on 30 acres and also consist of a host of support buildings, including a service equipment building, a fan house, and a waste handling building. It was a research reactor, so you can't compare it to a power reactor at all. Power reactors are significantly larger than a research reactor and designed to produce energy. The utility is in the business of producing electric power, not advancing the state of the art. 
we were advancing the state of the art. Test reactors are much smaller, operate at lower power levels, and do not generate heat for use as energy. Instead, the focus is on providing access to just enough radiation to conduct nuclear experiments. And actually, the fuel was patterned after the MTR reactor in Idaho. MTR stood for Materials Testing Reactor. The Plum Brook reactor improved upon the design of the MTR. However, what set the Plum Brook reactor apart from the competition was that its core mission was that of a true research and testing facility, whereas the MTR, for instance, was used primarily for training purposes. High levels of neutron flux and flexibility of design would greatly enhance the research opportunities at the Plum Brook reactor facility. Neutron flux is simply a measure of the density of the neutrons that are being created. How many neutrons per cubic centimeter are created? In addition to high levels of neutron flux, the Plum Brook reactor would come to have the unique ability to conduct cryogenic experiments at temperatures hundreds of degrees below zero. Up to that point, there had never been a reactor facility that could determine the combined effects of both radiation and cryogenic temperatures. Reactor construction started in the fall of 1956. They told me that many times they would uh, dig a hole here and get a surprise. The surprise might be some pipes or pumps or whatever left over from the old ordnance works. And then they would have to stop what they were doing and analyze what, what this is and what to do about it. So I was able to watch a good part of the construction of the reactor facility and the hot laboratory. This was an advantage for me because I could see portions of the facility that would be later be closed over, for example, concrete shielding and so forth. I seen them pouring high density concrete with the Byrides concrete and the stone and, and 8 and 10, 12 foot thickness. I just wondered what we were getting into. I mean, I had never seen uh, facilities with that type of uh, thickness in walls. The bus took specialists in electrical, water flow, materials, and stress work from Lewis to Plumbrook on a daily basis. These engineers were handed a roll of prints and a hard hat, and given the responsibility of bringing the reactor through construction. was told to uh, plan on coming out here to Plumbrook to run the test on the reactor to make sure that the cooling water distribution in the reactor was adequate. And at that time, I didn't know a nuclear reactor from an auto engine, and I had to learn. Many of these individuals considered it to be one of the most rewarding periods of their career. It was a very challenging experience. I was on the line of fire. I had people looking over my shoulder. I was told the Congress was interested in getting that reactor started. While construction of the Plum Brook reactor proceeded, the technological front of the Cold War was heating up. So we realized we had a competitor, but I, I don't think I 
kept it very forward in my mind, but it was clear that we had a competitor out there. On October 4th, 1957, the Russians launched Sputnik, a beach ball-sized satellite that would strike fear in the hearts of Americans and leave them feeling technologically inferior to the Russians. Uh, Russia had put Sputnik in space when I was in the Army. And all of a sudden, why I heard reactions in the Army and from the public as well as, gee, they beat us, what are we going to do? And I saw a tremendous momentum in this country as to try to do something and uh, that, so that we wouldn't fall behind. One response to this realization was the creation of the National Aeronautics and Space Administration on October 1st, 1958, by President Eisenhower. It was going to make a large change because we were now a political, under a political appointee rather than a neutral, very carefully non-political connection for the NACA. In March of 1961, before the reactor could become functional, the aircraft nuclear propulsion program was canceled by JFK. The concept of having an airplane containing a nuclear reactor that was full of fission products, having that plane crash was more than people could, uh, could stand. I think. In addition to the unresolved design issues, the military's need for an atomic aircraft had been sharply diminished. Well, it was canceled because uh, two things, uh, inter intercontinental ballistic missiles, which could deliver a warhead many thousands of miles away, and the, the hydrogen bomb helped too. So uh, you didn't have to hit quite as close as with a, a fission bomb. The nearly completed $10 million Plumbrook reactor facility was suddenly left hanging without a focus. We go into space because whatever mankind must undertake, free men must fully share. I therefore ask the Congress Around the same time, President Kennedy gave a major push to the space race. ...to provide the funds which are needed to meet the following national goals. First, I believe that this nation should commit itself to achieving the goal before this decade is out of landing a man on the moon and returning him safely to the earth. And of course, that really means that everybody had their marching orders. And we were serious about this. And the thing that was exciting about that is that the public was behind it. President Kennedy was looking for ways to really accelerate the U.S. Uh, program. Secondly, an additional $23 million, together with $7 million already available, will accelerate development of the Rover nuclear rocket. This gives promise of someday providing a means for even more exciting an ambitious exploration of space, perhaps beyond the moon, perhaps to the very end of the solar system itself. Nuclear-powered rockets had been discussed theoretically since the days of Robert Goddard, in particular toward interplanetary travel. It was at the AEC's Los Alamos Scientific Laboratory that the first steps were taken. Scientists set about to determine if nuclear energy really could be used to provide rocket propulsion. Theoretical studies and early experimental work revealed many problems that would have to be solved. Los Alamos was ready to make the leap from research to development. Under a new project named the Kiwi Program, they planned to design and test working nuclear rocket engines. A much safer testing area was needed. All eyes turned to the West. They obtained a space at the Nevada test site. Nevada, USA. This is the valley where the giant mushrooms grow. 
More atomic bombs have been exploded on these few hundred square miles of desert than on any other spot on the globe. Everyone knew nuclear testing was acceptable there. After all, our weapons testing had been done there. So this was an adjacent area called Jackass Flats. <laughs> Not because we were that way, but... <laughs> Today's missions are being accomplished with rockets that burn chemical fuels. But chemical fuels are heavy, and the cost of putting each pound into Earth orbit is very high. Nuclear rockets... In theory, nuclear propulsion is similar to conventional chemical propulsion. The major difference between the two is that nuclear propulsion uses a nuclear reactor to heat liquid fuel, in most cases hydrogen. All rockets work on the purpose principle of exhausting a high-speed, high-temperature propellant. And hydrogen was the best possible propellant of any kind because it had the lowest molecular weight. And a low molecular weight means you get higher velocity when you go through a jet and a nozzle. It would have to be carried in liquid form and go through the, reac the reactor and be heated up. And then it would be blasted out the back end and produce thrust. Comes out giving a specific impulse at least double what you can get in any, in the best chemical rocket. And the specific impulse is really the measure of, you might say, efficiency and performance capability uh, of the engine system itself in a rocket. It's basically the thrust divided by the uh, propellant per second. Uh, and the higher that is, the higher the efficiency of that propulsion system. Chemical rockets, maybe 400, could be a little bit higher in some cases. The nuclear rockets, at least 800, could go to 1,000, and even higher if you used some advanced nuclear rocket concepts. Project Rover had launched its most ambitious endeavor in the first half of 1961, the Nuclear Engine for Rocket Vehicle Application Program, or NERVA for short. This program expanded on the Kiwi work and would perform ground tests of full-scale nuclear rocket engines. The surge in nuclear rocket development across the country had breathed new life into the Plumbrook reactor facility. Plumbrook would soon play a role in the nation's nuclear rocket development. With the heightened competition between the U.S. and Russia came a massive recruiting effort by NASA. The uh, space effort is extremely interesting and it is a, uh, an area in which there will be considerable growth for the future. I think the young men in this country who have been properly trained in the sciences and technology uh, are in many cases eager to get into the program and this will afford them the opportunity. Working for NASA, the space agency, was such a tremendous goal in mind was very appealing at the time. The challenge of working for NASA in a nuclear capacity attracted a contingent of extremely competent engineers. I was interested in what I considered to be a limitless power. Oh, I was excited about coming to work here. Hey, this was a, indeed a great place to work. The technology was, was so high. NASA officials could have easily chosen to forego filing for a license with the Atomic Energy Commission. However, to ease the minds of the nearby community and to maintain safety, NASA officials decided to work through the commission. We, we were amongst the first, you know, they did not have uh, uh, a lot of set procedures. They got very rigid later on, but... One of the most daunting tasks was the publication of a three-volume document called the Final Hazard Summary. This report considered every possible accident at the reactor, including an airplane crashing into it. But it, it basically, the document itself basically went through the various systems in the reactor and, and looked at the hazards associated and determined that the place could safely operate according to the license they were going to get. When AEC officials visited the Plum Brook reactor facility, Abe Silverstein worked out the final licensing issues. It is said that Silverstein told AEC director Glenn Seaborg that the officials could not return to Washington until an agreement was reached.
Construction of the Plum Brook reactor facility was completed in March of 1961. Before the reactor could be put online, every system and component would have to be formally tested. Some of these tests last uh, many, many days, weeks, sometimes months. Just as the reactor was completed, the facility held a media day, opening their doors for the first time to the public. Excitement was in the air. On June 14, 1961, Harold Giesler took the Plum Brook reactor critical for the very first time. No whistles, no bells, uh, no bands in the middle of the night. We've been working real hard for three or four years to bring the thing online, and we finally have succeeded in doing that. The fellows that were in charge and that were taking the reactor up to critical point, I kept thinking, they are so cool. Nothing showed, on the outside anyway, that they were excited or whatever. Because you have to understand what's going on in the bowels of that reactor. And all you're watching is a graft, a chart, a red line. And the red line could represent many, many, many things. So you really had to know what, what you were looking at. Let's slow down that fission a million or so times. A single particle starts the reaction, splitting the uranium atom. Here now is the release of energy as heat and blast. Here are powerful rays being given off, similar to X-rays. But here, here are free neutrons driven out with tremendous speed. And provided there is sufficient U-235 present, what science calls a critical mass, those neutrons bombard other uranium atoms, causing them to split and split still others, keeping the chain reaction going. So a nuclear reactor is nothing more than a method for controlling those nuclear fissions. Once you learn how to make those fissions produce energy, you can regulate the amount of energy and how you use it. The reactor operators were responsible for all of the monitoring and controls in the control room. They were in control of the fission process and answered only to the shift supervisor. Thirty years since their last shutdown, these operators are still able to discuss just how they used to run the Plum Brook reactor. This console right here is the console that we control the, what we call the shim rods. And this is where the, uh, the uranium was added to the core. I might want to mention the, uh, the slant panel up here with our alarms. Uh, if I remember right, these 100 radiation alarms 
were uh, in and about the facility, and I believe those were in and about the, ex the uh, experiments. Come over here, you had the controls for regulating rods. These were two rods on the outside, or we shaped the flux in the uh, nuclear core using these reg rods. We had all types of indicators uh, that indicated the position of valves that were shown on the reactor water system up above. The reactor control room was state of the art. Our reactor control was the first solid state electronic control room in the country. And uh, it was so automated that it would almost run itself. Although we very seldom ever run it in that mode. We always had the human factor involved. I'm a former pilot, and you never rely upon one instrument when you're flying an airplane. And that's the same as operating in a reactor, that you look at all the instruments to exactly tell you exactly what's happening and, and why. And that was the key to a good operator. If he would see more than one instrument uh, trending one way or another, then with his background and training, he could probably uh, make a correction and bring the reactor right back on course. Each reactor operator had to be licensed by the Atomic Energy Commission. In order to be licensed, each operator went through six months of extensive training, an eight-hour written exam, a four-hour walk-around, and testing on the reactor controls. Once the reactor was up and running, under normal operating conditions, the work settled into a routine. When uh, the reactor is operating and, and uh, all systems were normal, uh, it was kind of boring. Ninety-some percent uh, routine and uh, maybe two or three percent panic when something goes wrong and you better fix it. When you got an alarm or panic struck, the, ro the control room had to be cleared because now, you know, it's serious. Shutdowns and scrams were relatively common and did not necessarily mean that there was a major danger present. If anything was anomalous, indicators indicated that uh, something wasn't right and it was a critical parameter we had here in the middle the red scram button. So, and what you do is you push this button and all the control rods would immediately fall by gravity into, into the core. The term scram dates back to the early days of nuclear science. And actually that term stands for uh, safety control rod x -Man. The story of that came back from the very first reactor. Enrico Fermi, and his staff was starting up the first nuclear reactor. They had a man that had a rope attached to the control rod, and the man was standing there with an axe. And what he would do is, when they said scram, he was to take the axe, cut the rope, and everybody would run from the reactor if something went wrong. Should all other measures fail, the reactor was equipped with a poison injection system to shut down the reactor. There was a tank, and it was hooked up directly to the reactor. We actually had the system made up of what's called gadolinium nitrate. Poison to uh, a critical reactor. It will absorb the neutrons basically before they get to the uranium. When you sprayed that inside the core, it shut it down instantly. We know the system works because it happened accidentally a couple of times. I think I was cleaning, just had a, a rag or something and saw some dust there, and I accidentally pushed that button. And my next announcement was, the reactor has scrammed, the reactor has scrammed. People came running and, what happened? I said, well, I pushed the button, the gadolinium, the poison button, accidentally. All I could do is hang my head in shame for a few days and then 
Everybody patted me on the back and said, Jim, it could happen to anybody. I said, yeah, but I'm an operator. To fully understand the value of the Plumbrook reactor, one must understand how a reactor works. This reactor used the highly enriched, the 93% U-235 fuel. That fully enriched uh, uranium-235 would then be put into these fuel elements, aluminum clad, 14 plates in an element, and then we had, uh, I think, 27 fuel elements in the reactor. When they brought the fuel elements in, in these cases, it was stored in the vault in the reactor office and laboratory building. And all the new fuel elements were kept in that vault. grams of U-235 in that core. That's a lot of uranium. The heart of the Plumbrook reactor was the core, which consisted of 22 fuel elements placed in a 3 by 9 lattice. This core was surrounded by 44 beryllium reflector plates and moderated with water. Been using water as a coolant, it provides what was known as a negative reactivity coefficient. And that automatically lowers the power of the reactor if the temperature of the coolant starts to increase. Despite the presence of the reflectors, some neutrons do escape the core. In this case, water, steel, and concrete shielding is used to prevent radiation from spreading out to the environment. The reactor area was located within an all-metal containment vessel. Everything was painted white. It was always spotless and always white. Even a home would never be that clean. It was just part of the aura of the whole thing. Squeaky clean, I guess you'd say. Surrounding the core itself, was a reactor tank built to provide maximum experiment access while the reactor was running. A research reactor is built, though, to provide an unusual amount of access right inside the reactor or very close to it so that you can get as high uh, a level of the neutron environment as possible. Maybe I should pull out this rabbit out of my pocket since it's, it's pertinent to your question. One method for experiment insertion was the rabbit system. The rabbits. The rabbits were uh, small, maybe about three, three inches th long, and they were aluminum. Uh, little capsules, which fitted in a pipe. The rabbits were these metal containers that the top screwed on them, and then they, they would put a weld seal around it, and the material that was to be irradiated was inside of this and it usually contained a certain amount of water. Those rabbits are, you know, very similar to what you see at a bank, which is run by pneumatics. Well, I'm talking hydraulics, where basically we used water to uh, basically push the rabbit into the reactor core area. And then it was usually irradiated for a certain period of time. It might be 10 minutes, it might be 10 months. And after a certain time, we reversed the flow of that water, and it brought the rabbit back out. And then you analyze this radioactive material by, the, uh, by sophisticated means. Water was an essential element to the Plumbrook reactor. The reactor required one million gallons of water daily for both shielding and cooling.
Plumbrook had two pumping stations to obtain raw water from Lake Erie. Divers had to flush the intakes and clear them of silt and debris on a regular basis. It took lake water and purified it into deionized water, pure, very pure water. The reactor was surrounded by four 25-foot deep quadrants, which provided both shielding and coolant. All of the experiments could be inserted uh, remotely into various positions in the reactor, and this could all be done under 25 foot of water shielding. When the experiments were brought into the reactor facility, of course, they were cold and clean. You could hold them in your hand. Once they were exposed to neutron radiation, they became highly radioactive. Highly radioactive. After being irradiated in the core, the experiments were transferred through a series of underwater canals to the adjacent hot lab building. Technicians worked from a movable bridge that allowed them to continually guide the objects with long poles as they moved through the canal system. And the 25 feet of water provided the radiation shield to us that were moving those experiments under that water. Radioactive materials were moved underwater to the hot lab for handling and inspection. An 80-ton lead door separated the hot handling room from the controlled work area. It's a long process about even getting in there. Talk about time-consuming. Uh, the individual technician would have double coveralls on, surgeon's cap, full face mask so that he didn't breathe any particulate in, and he would have a fellow standing behind him to make sure that, you know, uh, he wasn't getting too much radiation. And uh, to eliminate any, any contamination or radiation problems, everything was, was done behind three, three foot glass. Uh, each cell was uh, equipped with two manipulators so that the guy could use his left hand and right hand to do all these functions and experiments inside the cell. Each window had two master slave manipulators. Whatever we did out here, if I squeezed it like this, two fingers inside were, were coming together. They were very, very proficient, could do very minute operations with mechanical manipulators. We were completely amazed at those uh, operators and technicians who could uh, thread a needle with those ma manipulators. At first it was a little bit difficult. Uh, after some practice, uh, it was easy. When we went to um, sideshows or Cedar Point, he was able to manipulate those little grabbers to get prizes. These uh, windows are uh, essentially a leaded, uh, a leaded glass window. Uh, their alternate layer is rotated so that you get a pure undistorted image when you look through that amount of glass. The glass is also filled with mineral oil to help maintain the optical clarity from one panel to another. Each of the seven cells had its own purpose, from dismantling experiments with power tools to conducting tensile testing and chemical analysis. Specimens could be prepared and mounted. Radiochemistry could be performed. Metallographic tests could be performed. Uh, various mechanical tests like tensile tests um, and hardness and so forth, you know, could all be performed to determine uh, what the effects of the radiation were. These were then compared to non-irradiated specimens uh, that had been very carefully characterized and they could detect very subtle changes or extreme changes in materials as a result 
of various radiation in her form. In mid-1962, President Kennedy was slated to tour Los Alamos and the Nevada test site. I think he was fundamentally interested in seeing what was being done to achieve the goal that he had already established to land people on the moon and try to indicate the very strong leadership of the United States. He enjoyed seeing the uh, equipment. He actually played with some of the remote manipulators and I can tell you he was beaming as he was uh, doing it. At one point during the visit, President Kennedy asked the direct question, what is the function of the nuclear rocket in achieving the lunar landing? And that's when the question was turned to me. And I said, Mr. President, we are not depending on achieving that goal with nuclear rockets. However, we aren't sure yet what it's going to take in terms of payload requirements and other requirements to achieve a lunar, land, lunar landing mission. And therefore, the importance of the nuclear rocket is that if we need more than the chemical rocket, being developed is capable of, then we have a nuclear upper stage that could be added uh, to it. By the mid-1960s, NASA and the AEC had spent an accumulated $584 million for research into nuclear applications for space. The work going on at the Nevada test site was supported by the Plum Brook reactor. There was a reactor with very high uh, capability to do materials test work with exposure to high levels uh, of radiation. Uh, and we did have materials work going on there. Well, many of these experiments were centered around gathering data in order to support that program. And, this, and many were developed and uh, initiated by Lewis Research Center, as well as under contract. So there's no question that the Plumbrook reactor provided a very significant science base of knowledge. The reactor could hold uh, many e experiments and run many experiments at one time, sometimes 20 to 30 experiments at one time. Some continually, year after year. There were four basic types of experiments conducted at the Plumbrook reactor. They included experiments for the nuclear rocket program, energy conversion experiments, basic radiation effect studies, and basic physics experiments. These experiments consisted of irradiating various materials, components, and devices to determine how their properties had changed as a result of being irradiated. We analyzed uh, samples from uh, the various coal-burning power plants. We irradiated fuel specimens that were to support the commercial nuclear power business. We analyzed oil samples. We did control drum actuator irradiations for the nuclear rocket program. We analyzed fly ash that came out of the stacks of power plants. We irradiated electronic components, again, for general space application. So we did a lot of samples like that. We ran thousands of samples a year over a two or three year period. We did a lot of analyses but one of the things that, uh, that stands out, after the first Apollo shot that brought back the moon rocks, we were one of the labs chosen to do the irradiation. We irradiated it to make it radioactive. And this was part of the process known as neutron activation analysis. We had done so much uh, work in pushing the state of the art in other areas that uh, irradiating moon rocks didn't seem that, that critical or that interesting from the other things that we were doing. NASA scientists wanted to examine the effects of radiation on components in an outer space environment. In order to do this properly, they created temperatures hundreds of degrees below zero. A $1.4 million cryogenic facility was built that could chill materials to cryogenic temperatures while they were being exposed to the high neutron flux levels of the core.
not only did you have a radiation environment, but you had a very low temperature environment. Testing down to liquid helium temperatures, which is about minus 455 or something like that, a few degrees above absolute zero. But while that thing was in the reactor getting neutron bombardment after it attained a certain amount of neutron flux, we had helium flowing around that thing. And then while it was in that little head, we broke that sample. I mean, the technology that was involved in that was, was outstanding. High-tech stuff. Experiments were planned months in advance. The experiment, uh, the, as conceived, would have to go for review to the uh, safeguards committee. And then whenever we did the test, the engineer was always on hand to see what the data was looking like when it was coming out. So Yes, the data would then be available to the sponsor. He was often present, at least off and on, during many of the irradiations. Maximum online time for the reactor was a top priority. As such, the reactor operated 24 hours a day, seven days a week. We operated better than 80% of the time that was available to us, and that, that was, my understanding, was a record in the industry for a research reactor to be online as much as we were. Christmas, New Year's, Thanksgiving, the reactor ran around the clock. A close sense of community and family quickly enveloped the Plumbrook employees. It was natural, since many had relocated in order to take the job. Many of them were the same age and had similar family situations. We were basically all young guys right out of college, having graduated within a year or two of one another. We were all young, just starting families, and because we were not from this area, that the family was the people that we worked with. like one big happy family for quite a while. They worked hard and partied hard. In the process, they formed lifelong friendships.
We were more than professionals, we were friends. Yeah. Of course, when you're running a reactor, Radiation safety is your primary focus because you don't want anybody to get hurt. Almost every job performed at the reactor first came through the health physics office. The office would verify the safety of the work, write a safe work permit, and make sure the proper personal protection equipment was used. It would then monitor the work as it was being performed. So we had timekeepers on jobs. We'd pull people out when they received a predetermined dose limit. All personnel were monitored for radiation exposure by utilizing film badge dosimetry. It was really uh, almost impossible to get yourself into trouble unless you really violated some of, some of the standing regulations that they had. Personnel decontamination was occasionally necessary. Uh, the decontamination of personnel was basically a shower. So you'd have the man shower and then you'd monitor his skin for both direct radiation and for contamination. Through remote area monitoring systems, the reactor operator could monitor radiation levels throughout the facility. If necessary, the reactor could shut itself down automatically if the detectors discovered any sudden irregularities. Radioactive waste was carefully packaged, monitored, and disposed of. The routine radioactive materials were low level, and uh, they were put in 50-gallon drums the more highly radioactive materials, uh, casks were provided, and these were lead-lined, heavy casks. The AEC visited the facility on a regular basis to ensure compliance of the facility and the abilities of the employees. We were inspected uh, about every six months, probably, by the Atomic Energy Commission and later by the Nuclear Regulatory Commission. And I must say, we had a safe facility. We were never cited by either of these uh, agencies for non-compliance with their regulations. To ensure community safety, NASA had extensive air, water, sewage, and vegetation monitoring systems, both on the Plum Brook Station and throughout the surrounding community. In addition to protecting the surrounding environment, NASA had an ongoing effort to educate the community. Dum, dum. Well, I'm old enough to remember Duck and Cover. There was a turtle by the name of Bert, and the turtle was very alert. When danger threatened him, he never got hurt. He knew just what to do. He ducked and cover. So, you know, we hid under our desks and we had he nuclear reactor drills. Yes, do. because the reactor was here. And you, and you, and you. Here's Tony going to his Cub Scout meeting. Tony knows the bomb can explode any time of the year, day or night. He is ready for it. Duck and cover. Atta boy, Tony. That flash means act fast. The presence Tony of a nuclear knows. reactor had heightened Cold War concerns. And the first time I heard of it was probably the news media scared the kids. And they said, well, there's a reactor there in Sandusky. And Castro says he's going to... Um, set his uh, missiles at places like those that have the reactors. And so the kids suddenly were afraid, and they'd never even thought about it before. And I told them that uh, I had a history teacher in high school who said he could prove to us that God loved America. And I said, I've never mentioned God as a teacher because we're not allowed to do that. But I think that there's a lot to be said for it. I don't think we need to worry. A few cases of irrational fear did arise. Reactor employee Myrna Steele was left with a head full of wet, soapy hair when the local beautician found out she worked at the reactor and fled from her side. There was a, a farmer in the area that kept complaining in the local newspaper that Plumbrook was putting something into the air because 
every time a storm would come through here, it would hit Plumbrook, and then it would just split and divide, and he was on the east side of the facility, and he wouldn't get it the rain necessary for his crops. He's, he says, now, that reactor that you have over there is really doing something to the weather, and I don't get any rain, so it has to be you. <laughs> I can assure you Plumbrook was putting nothing into the air that caused the rain to split when, when it hit Plumbrook. In order to prevent the spread of misinformation and to inform the community of its activities, NASA invited the community in to tour the facility. It's not like we closed the place down and uh, kept it secret. Uh, we had a lot of open houses over there at the facility where the public could come in and uh, we set up tours where they could walk through and look at everything. Each year, we had approximately eight to 10,000 people go through the various facilities. We opened the reactor uh, hatch so that people could go out onto what's known as the lily pad and actually go out and look down into the uh, reactor vessel itself and, and see the core of the reactor. On December 11, 1972, the Apollo 17 lunar module touched down safely on the surface of the moon. I was strolling on the moon one day. During the next 75 hours, Eugene Cernan and Harrison Schmidt would explore over a distance of 30 kilometers on the moon's surface. What would have been viewed as a rousing success just a decade before was now lost on many Americans. For America was being consumed by the war in Vietnam. Right away, Houston. On December 18th, as the astronauts sped through the silent vacuum of space toward home, a fiery bombing campaign was beginning somewhere on the planet below them. Named the Christmas Bombings, the campaign would carpet North Vietnam with over 100,000 bombs in just 12 days. Amidst the horror, Apollo 17 returned with but a quiet splash. It was December 19, 1972, and the U.S. manned program to the moon had come to an end. Back at the reactor, the spirit of the holidays was in the air. Despite what could be a difficult work schedule, the reactor workers put a positive spin on things. Uh, if I remember right, I think we had a... Uh a small Christmas tree uh, somewhere in here around Christmas time and uh, had played uh, Christmas carols in the background. Uh, this was our home.
Christmas came to Sandusky. On December 26th of 1972, just one day after Christmas, a memo seen here was drafted in Washington, D.C. Within a few days, this memo was proofed, carefully typed, and sent on its way to various sites across the country. One version of the memo would be sent to Bruce London, the center director at NASA Lewis. January 5th, 1973, was that it? January 5th, 1973, yes. There were a lot of stunned people that day. And after seeing this, uh, working with the folks in Washington, I can understand this and can therefore accept the rationale for this decision. It's one I don't agree with. I don't think that it's exactly right to do it just this way, but I can understand it and accept it and that's what all of us have to do now. Uh, I can recall sitting in that, uh, that, that room when uh, Bruce London, the director of Lewis, walked down the aisle, and uh, by the expression on his face, we all knew this was not good news. Uh, this means, of course, that the reactor here at Plumbrook will be closed down dur during the remainder of this current fiscal year. And the announcement was, we're closing this facility, we've got six months to put it to bed, and then everybody's gone. And uh, it was a shock. Speechless. Very somber. Very sad feeling. You know, it was not a happy day by any means. Uh, we went back to the reactor, and nobody seemed to know what to do. Uh, the announcement came probably around 1 o'clock, something like that, or 1.30, the, the reactor would uh, undergo its final shutdown at 2 o'clock that day. And everybody gathered around. I happened to have a Polaroid camera handy, and uh, I took, uh, I snapped the picture the moment that the, the uh, reg rod was locked for the final shutdown of the reactor. But it was an experience. There was a lot of sad eyes, really. In fact, you could look at people and you'd, uh, you'd wonder if there were tears in their eyes. And uh, at some point in time, there about uh, the, the comment was made, I believe, by Bill Fessich, that old reactors never die, they just decay away. At the end of the day, as we left the reactor facility, there were uh, people from newspapers and other media waiting to talk to us. And uh, I, for one, was not interested in talking to anybody. Some people did volunteer. Most of us did not. We just walked to our cars. Most of the people went to the local bar and drank quite a bit. <laughs> the nuclear propulsion work across the country had come to an end with a shockwave felt from the Plumbrook reactor to the Nevada test site, thousands of miles away. And with it, the cycle of beginnings and endings that had long defined the area had come to the employees of the Plum Brook reactor. Each would have to find his or her own way to cope with the surprising and defeating news. I had to call my wife. It was our anniversary date, January 5th, the day that I found out I would no longer have a job, and I had to call her and tell her. That's it. Hell of a thing to tell a wife on an anniversary. <laughs> and she, she was silent for a minute. She said, what are we going to do? And I said, well, we're going to do the same thing we always do. Take the ball and run. <laughs> Fast as we can. From a personal standpoint, it was a big shock because we had not sold a home in Sandusky yet. We owned the home in Milan and I had a wife and five children, 
and they said, in six months, you're out of a job. So <laughs> that made it rather interesting times. After quickly recovering from the initial jolt, the Plum Brook team worked diligently to meet the June 30, 1973 shutdown deadline. We, we became absorbed in our work. It got rid of a lot of the outside problems. I did not see a bunch of people moping around, wondering what was going to happen to their jobs. Uh, I saw everyone continuing on with a new schedule, putting together a new schedule for shutdown. It was a very ambitious schedule to try to get the facility shut down by July 1st. It was a job and we were NASA trained, so we did it just exactly like we did our other jobs while we were with NASA. And I'm proud of the fact I didn't break down and start crying, <laughs> although I felt like it. During the spring of 1973, the nuclear fuel and wastes were removed and the still radioactive equipment was placed into the hot cells. The rest of the facility was decontaminated and placed in safe, dry storage. Initially, it was thought that the reactor would be used again as Mars missions developed in the 1980s. In the meantime, other possible uses for the reactor were sought. However, few suggestions were forthcoming. We can have a mode of operation at about the tenth of the power that would have about the tenth of the cost and this being around a half million dollars a year should be available for many universities in a combined operation. The NASA officials primarily were interested in talking with the representatives from the 17 universities who were here about this 15 million dollar nuclear reactor, a 60,000 watt facility that will be closed down as of the end of June, the first of the Plumbrook Station facilities to be phased out. For TV3 Newsday, this is John Harrington. And I think everybody thought that it was going to shut down. Yeah, we're going to go someplace else for work for someplace and uh, else for a while and then come back and we're going to start this thing back up again and run some more experiments in it. But of course, as we know, that never did happen. We had to fire good people because there was no other kind of people to get rid of. You know? So that was a tough job and uh, very painful. I can still remember that. It brings tears to my eyes to remember how we had to tell people they had to leave when they were doing such great work. But it had to be done and we had to do it. Yeah, I certainly didn't want to leave. Uh, I ultimately ended up doing some of the same type of work at Lewis but it wasn't quite the same. NASA did everything in their power in contacting industries and telling what these people were like, helping all of the people get a position. I'm satisfied with the way they did it. I hated it that they did it, but I'm satisfied. I don't think, uh from what I've been able to see that there's a, uh, a lot of bitterness, uh, but it's hard to tell reactions change uh, as time goes by. Uh, well, I think there are, there are certain logical uh, aspects to, to cutting back, but I think the, uh, there, are, there is a mistake in it. There's a mistake in, in cutting back the, the research that, that produces new technologies for our country, which uh, in my way of looking at things, is really the only thing that we've got to sell to the rest of the world. Now, if we, if we don't continue to produce new technologies, uh, what are we going to market 10 years from now, 10 years from now? In the end, the Plum Brook reactor was closed for a number of reasons. The U.S. had proven its technological superiority to the Soviet Union, and the space program was fading away from the public's list of priorities. The nuclear rocket program had been very successful in its efforts, and exhibited the ability to adapt from its early beginnings as a weapon system, to later consideration as a booster to the Moon or Mars. And yet, with no clearly defined mission, it was hard-pressed to justify the continuation of its huge expenditures. Had the program been able to adapt towards a smaller, more easily managed effort, it might have survived. A workforce and knowledge base could have been maintained. Instead, they would be lost. Finally, 
the struggle with Vietnam, a rise in anti-nuclear sentiment, and the burgeoning field of robotic explorers were eclipsing support for the nuclear program. Coming back to the reactor for the filming of this documentary has been difficult for some and not so difficult for others. Boy, I started right with every nut and bolt and uh, went right through that. And to see it all, just the paint falling in and all that, it's not good, not good. You go back and you don't recognize where you are really. It was like you were on the moon. It was real strange and not a very good feeling because you always remember what it was like. As I walk through the reactor uh, today, certainly a tear, tear comes to my eye that, you know, that all of those great facilities, you know, weren't kept up. But on the other hand, as I look at the, uh, as I look at the controls, I realized that that was basically 1950s, 1960s technology. And we're a long way, we've gone, come a long way since then. I think I was let down to think that there were so many well-trained young engineers, technicians here with a lot of potential that I really feel did not get a chance to, to really prove themselves uh, in, their, in their work. It is sad because so much hope and so much uh, expertise and so many intelligent people uh, worked so hard to build that reactor the only one that NACA or the NASA has ever had. And when I walked in the control room and saw on panel B and C all of the holes left by the instruments, that hit me like a mule kick in me. I felt very, very, very sad. It's always difficult to see it that way. Back in 1974, it was difficult to see it. You almost feel like the place is haunted. into some of the offices where there are blackboards and they, the uh, occupants of the offices had written down various things about the shutdown, how they felt about it and so forth. And those blackboards are still there.
We still had to maintain controls at the reactor facility. We still did a lot of environmentals over there. We checked all the rad zones on a periodic basis, uh, took samples, water samples, air samples. And we also had to ensure the maintenance of the facility. I went to Washington, D.C. many times to uh, try to get the, uh, the funds necessary to dismantle the, and decommission the reactor. And again, everyone felt that it should be done someday. But there were other priorities within NASA at a particular time. In 1996, NASA requested the renewal of its Possess But Do Not Operate license from the Nuclear Regulatory Commission. The NRC instead asked NASA to reconsider decommissioning. Decommissioning is best thought of, it's a phrase we use, but it, it really sums it up. It's construction in reverse. It's very careful, well thought out, well planned, strategic, taking apart, almost surgically taking apart this facility. The decision to proceed with the decommissioning was made based on escalating future cost estimates, availability of waste disposal licenses, and the fact that natural radioactive decay had decreased the levels of radiation in the plant, thereby making it easier to decommission. NASA's decommissioning plan was approved on March 20, 2002. Total budgeted cost for the uh, entire work, including what we've done to date, plus what we've yet to do, is $160 million. NASA approved the funds necessary to complete the decommissioning by 2007. We have a competent crew that is one of the best I've ever worked with. They picked the best of the best, and I feel this project is going to definitely show that in the end, and it shows it now. We're all on the same path trying to get to that goal. It just it takes time to get there. There's steps and procedures that have to be followed. The most difficult task has been with the cranes, and that was lifting of the shrapnel shields off the reactor tank. This is probably the heaviest lift we'll make during the project, and we were able to accomplish this again uh, safely and successfully. And really what we're doing with this decommissioning is writing the final chapter of what to this point has been a very proud story. And I feel personally committed to making sure that we do it right. We have, luckily, a community here of the retirees who have been incredible. I've used the retirees as consultants in on the project. I've used the retirees to train us on systems, and I'll continue to keep them engaged throughout this project. The, the word I would use to describe them is a gold mine. Everybody in the community knows that UFOs have landed here and very strange things that no one can explain happen. The fact of the matter is the gate is there for safety and the public can't come in and so everyone wonders. There were many people that had concerns about what was going on out here behind the fence. It seemed secretive. I didn't feel that the government would be forthright with us and that if there was any contamination involved that we wouldn't know. We began over three years ago with a community work group, which is a group made up of volunteers from the local community. Uh, we have educators, we have local business people, we have some representatives of the local government, some of the safety forces. We are part of a team. We feel like we are part of a team. I think that being able to go through the facility helped them better understand some of the things we'd been talking about. What a delight. It was just stunning. It just looked, just oozed, 1958. So I made the comment when I took the tour that it's, it's a shame we can't figure out a way to use it. Uh, it looked that good. It was important for us to actually see that. It's one thing to show pictures and have people tell us it's going to happen, to stand there and actually run our hands across 
with the non-radioactive parts to stand there and see it uh, was, was poignant and, and, and helpful. Once we've achieved the necessary cleanup levels, then we'll have the demolition of all the buildings down to three foot below grade. That material will be removed from site. The remaining hole will be backfilled with clean fill and we'll end up with a clean green field. The ultimate uh, goal of the decommissioning project is to return the land back to what's called a resident farmer scenario. You could plant tomatoes in the soil underneath what is now the reactor, eat the tomatoes and have no more radiation than you would if you'd have planted your tomatoes in any other Perkins Township garden. I think when the reactor is gone and uh, I stand on an open field that I will have a lot of good memories. Mm, I'm going to be very dreary. <laughs> I would consider it a real waste because I always felt that the reactor should have continued. I, I would think that's the way it should be. Uh, I mean, it, it's over, it's done with, put it away. But you see, we didn't get, we didn't live out our lifespan. We were cut short. So we, we never had an opportunity to find out what the uh, long-term impact of our work was. And a lot of the experiments that we were working were taken from here and run somebody else, someplace else. And it, well, anyway, we should have been able to continue the testing that we had already started. But it, as you say, it'll be an open field, and uh, that's not the reactor facility anymore. On October 15, 2003, the reactor's unique double water tower was brought down by a series of explosive charges at its base. Although much of the decommissioning work had already begun, for many, this would be the most dramatic evidence today that the reactor would soon be reduced to a green field. I didn't think they would ever go that far, but they did. The fact that we had that test reactor out here, it'll appear like a dream to me. From a green field, home to Indian tribes, to the farmers making their way west in hopes of starting over. From the ordnance employees working for the benefit of their country, to the reactor personnel doing much the same as the U.S. made its first steps into space. All had come to this very same land for a reason, and all had been abruptly asked to leave, bringing us back to a green field in the middle of the firelands, with just a spirit of their times remaining. Nothing lasts forever. <laughs> so when you think and you work in a place and you think you've got steady work and you see yourself going through to retirement at a place. Uh, that could be a, a dream. You, you can't predict the cycles of life. What then will be the legacy of the NASA Plumbrook Reactor Facility? The U.S. nuclear propulsion program has been dormant for 30 years. In that time, reactor science has advanced by leaps and bounds. Even so, one would expect much of the basic materials research conducted at Plum Brook to still be of scientific significance. And yet, no central clearinghouse ever existed for all the data gathered. Much to the frustration of the men who once ran the reactor, an unknown portion of that data has been lost throughout the passage of time. And I'm always concerned about how do we retrieve that? For that matter, how do we retain it? Because the people who worked on it are disappearing. Is there any hope then for the Plum Brook reactor facility to have made a significant and lasting contribution to space nuclear propulsion? We had a worthwhile operation going, but Congress cut back money and uh, the purpose of 
our being there. And uh, we thought that was a pretty short-sighted thing to do. Now Congress is looking at doing the same thing all over again. Early in 2003, NASA Administrator Sean O'Keefe announced that NASA would be making a concerted effort to get back into nuclear propulsion type work. Perhaps you should say we were ahead of our time. Because if we want to continue to be serious about the exploration of outer space, or explore Mars, for example, we're going to need something with the life and the specific impulse of a nuclear rocket. And therefore, we'll have to pull back all we learned before in order to try to apply what we learned in the rover and NERVA programs. Perhaps then, the real value of the Plumbrook reactor facility will lie in the lessons it can teach us for this future work. Basic research takes time. Towering achievements are built atop myriad asides and dead ends. Yet a long-term financial commitment and a clearly defined set of objectives will shore up the foundation for the long run. Protect the knowledge base. The U.S. nuclear propulsion program was incapable of being scaled back to a smaller, more easily financed and managed effort. As a consequence, the program was abruptly cancelled during a time of political and financial crisis, putting the widely scattered materials research knowledge base at risk. Had a central clearinghouse for the data existed, that work would be better available to inform current and future efforts. We choose to go to the moon in this decade and do the other things, not because they are easy, but because they are hard. Because that Challenge the workforce to reach new heights. Be it a national call to action or an organizational directive, the men and women of this country will excel when called upon to pioneer new technologies. The NASA Plumbrook Reactor Facility was designed by men who had little experience in the discipline. And yet, through hard work and persistence, these extremely capable engineers were able to design a state-of-the-art facility. With its bright and energetic young staff, the facility went on to achieve an incredible 80% online time, a near-perfect operation, and an exemplary safety record. Much of the research conducted at the facility, including cryogenic nuclear research, remains unique through today. As we look forward toward a day when nuclear rockets are used for space travel, we would do well to remember the men and women that laid a portion of the groundwork toward those very same efforts 30 years ago. Many have passed on. Of the remainder, a good portion have scattered far about the country. Yet, despite the distance, this nuclear family remains close. And while the reactor they once called home will soon be gone, their legacy of pride, hard work and accomplishment will live on. NASA has decided to name their new nuclear program Project Prometheus. 
It is encouraging to find that the name means forethought. And it is oddly poetic to find that the legend of Prometheus tells the story of the Greek Titan who gave the gift of fire to humanity. I believe that this nation should commit itself to achieving the goal before this decade is out of landing a man on the moon and returning him safely to the earth. We'll accelerate development of the Rover nuclear rocket. This gives promise of someday providing a means for even more exciting and ambitious exploration of space, perhaps beyond the moon, perhaps to the very end of the solar system itself. And so, we have come full circle back to fire. It can destroy, or it can rejuvenate, blazing a new trail to the heavens. The choice we make will define the next generation of space travel and light the way for the family of men and women who will take us there.